Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to uh, Marion University. Uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, and to the uh, uh, speaker series of the Richard Luger Franciscan Center for Global Studies. My name is Pierre Atlas. I'm a political science professor here at Marion, and I serve as director of the Luger Franciscan Center. And um, I'd like to take a couple minutes just to tell you a little bit about what we do um, before I introduce tonight's speaker. So the Luger Franciscan Center consists of two uh, fundamental parts. One is the speaker series, the public affairs aspect, which uh, you are here for tonight. And the other is our academic program in global studies. Global studies is a minor, an interdisciplinary minor, that is designed to fit with any major in, at Marion University in the professional studies or the liberal arts and sciences. And we have students in the global studies program who are biology pre-med majors, who are uh, communication and theology, uh, in the business school, in nursing, in secondary education, uh, you name it, we have students in the program. The academic, the academic minor uh, requires an additional year of foreign language study, a study abroad experience, and um, uh, interdisciplinary courses in global studies taught by different departments. And it's a really nice package for those students here at Marion who are freshmen or sophomores and you're thinking about a minor, it's definitely something to add on to. And for those of you who may have uh, uh, kids or grandkids thinking about college, um, it's definitely a nice uh, value-added package that can be added to any uh, major in, in, uh, at Marion. We also have scholarships attached to the Global Studies program, and that is called the Luger Fellow Scholarship. And uh, again, that goes to students majoring in all different kinds of things. And actually, uh, of the 25 or so Luger Fellows we have right now, the majority, the largest major of Luger Fellows is actually biology pre-med. Um, so that's the, uh, the, the, the number one. Actually, who here in the audience is a Luger Fellow? Raise your hand. Okay, very good. So we have a few of them here today. Um, oh, okay. Uh, can you, all right. This isn't, uh, can we boost it at all or? No. All right. Okay. I'll just, all right. I'll, I'll talk really loud then. Okay. Um, what, one of the nice things about the, uh, the Global Studies program uh, is that uh, in addition to uh, studying abroad and additional language and these different courses, is students in the program are also eligible to participate in uh, the uh, annual uh, spring break program in Washington, D.C., where I take some students to Washington and we spend seven days in D.C. meeting with congressmen and senators. We visit the Chinese embassy. Uh, we visit uh, think tanks, uh, the World Bank, all sorts of things. A very, very, very interesting and exciting program. And that sort of gives people a, a heads up or a, an opening to uh, Washington, D.C. as both a national and a global capital. Uh, the other aspect of the Global Studies Center is our speaker series, uh, which tonight is our latest installment. And we have two more left in this academic year. And outside we have uh, brochures, if you haven't picked one up. Uh, we try and do an event every month. Um, we do not have a, an event coming in February, but we do have one in March and one in April. On March 31st, we're bringing in uh, Ambassador Faisal Istrabadi of uh, Indiana University in Bloomington. He directs the Center for the Study of the Middle East, and he's also a, a professor at the law school. And he is uh, an Iraqi American who was uh, Iraq's ambassador to the United Nations after uh, Saddam Hussein was overthrown. And he will be speaking on the future of Iraq on March 31st. Very well timed. Uh, he'll be talking about all sorts of things and answering your questions about Iraq, ISIS, uh, the uh, what's going on between uh, Shiites and Sunnis and everything. And he's a real expert on this and a very, very, uh, very neat person. And then finally this year, uh, the last event of this academic year is on April 6th. And it's with Mark Miles, who is the CEO of Holman & Company, um, which uh, runs the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and the IndyCar Racing Series, among other things. And he will be speaking on the Indianapolis 500-mile race, 100 years of global impact. And, uh, and that'll be a very interesting uh, talk. And then, as it so happens, uh, not coincidentally, the next month uh, we will have the 100th running of the Indianapolis 500. So uh, anyway, so these are the two events. All of our events are free and open to the public. I hope you will come. And then um, uh, we'll be working on a really exciting speaker series for next year. And right now, this is our 12th uh, year of the Global Studies Speaker Series. So please uh, keep coming. Now it is uh, my, my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight. Jeffrey H. Smullyan, an Indianapolis veteran, excuse me, an Indianapolis native um, and veteran, I guess, Indianapolis native, serves as a founder and chairman of MS Communications uh, Corporation, which is an Indianapolis-based radio and magazine publishing company with operations in nine major U.S. markets. MS has been named by one of Fortune Magazine's 100 best companies to work for. Jeff is the leading advocate of FN-enabled wireless devices, putting them into smartphones, um, known as Next Radio, and this is something that he will tell you about. It's a very exciting uh, new uh, project that is uh, going to transform um, the, the radio industry in many exciting ways. Um, uh, Jeff became, uh, he formed and became the principal shareholder of Emmis in 1980. 
Today it is a publicly traded company on the NASDAQ, and it owns and operates 19 FM and 4 AM radio stations in the nation's largest markets, um, as well as several uh, city and regional magazines, including a couple that are pretty well known, Texas Monthly and Los Angeles. Amos owns the two uh, major hip-hop brands in the United States, or in the world actually, KPWR in Los Angeles and Hot 97 in New York City. Here in Indianapolis, uh, Emma stations include Hank FM, which is a really good country station, WIBC, 1070 The Fan, and B105.7 Soft Rock. These are all Emma stations here in town. Jeff has earned numerous awards uh, from, in the, the, from the radio and television industry, and he's also a Sagamore of the Wabash. In addition to being a national leader of the broadcasting industry, uh, as a principal as a principal shareholder, he led a group that purchased the Seattle Mariners baseball team in 1989 and then uh, selling the club three years later. During that period, he served on the Major League Baseball owners' ownership and television, uh, ownership and television committees and has a lot of really uh, interesting experiences from being in Major League Baseball. He's also a member of the Board of Trustees of his alma mater, the University of Southern California. In 1994, uh, Jeff was named by President Bill Clinton to head the U.S. delegation to the International Telecommunications Union, which is a United Nations organization based in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, and I, I'm, I think I'm going to ask him about this a little bit, but uh, at, at, uh, as the U.S. ambassador to this organization, he represented the United States in various bilateral meetings, including negotiating a landmark agreement between Israel and the Palestine Liberation Organization after the signing of the Oslo Accords. Jeff earned his BA in history and telecommunications from USC and also holds a law degree from the USC School of Law. He resides in Indianapolis with his wife, Heather. He has three children, Samantha, Kari, and, and Bradley, and I think one of them is here tonight, yes. right? Um, it is uh, my real pleasure to introduce Jeff Smillian. All right. Pierre, thank you. Um, I have to tell you, he gives a lot of speeches everywhere, all over. Um, but I'm a little intimidated tonight. This is the first time that I've ever given a speech where my daughter Sam has appeared. So I want to welcome Sam. Um, she'll be the one who will be falling asleep at, at about minute seven. Um, seriously, it's, uh, it's fun to be here. Um, I work with Pierre on some things, and it's a pleasure, and uh, I'm honored that you have me here tonight. Um, I'm supposed to talk about the future of global communications, and I guess it really is summed up in one word, and that's the internet. Because the internet's changed everything. And it's changed everything for the good, because it provides access all over the world. A child in a village in Africa can access the great works of literature and access information from every library all over the planet. A doctor in Asia can communicate with a medical center halfway around the world to provide life-saving information. Entrepreneurs can collaborate across continents to come up with new ideas. All of these things have changed our lives and have made our lives better. But it can also create the bad. Terrorists in a small village in Syria can recruit high school students in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Havoc can be reached instantaneously all over the world. For the good, governments can track people who would seek to do us harm. For the bad, governments and corporations can track almost any movement that we have. In our next radio experience, we've learned about beacon technology. You may not know this, but you can now be tracked in a grocery store and they can know exactly which aisle you're in and which product you're looking at. We are in a world in which many young people say privacy doesn't matter. They, they probably should get used to the fact that there won't be much privacy. The hottest thing in all of communications and advertising is data collection. And I can tell you that data collection goes into almost every aspect of your life, just through your smartphone, just through information and cameras all over the world, tracking devices. There's almost no place 
and no human experience that isn't tracked and monitored. The question that we have is, does anyone care about privacy? If they do, this is going to be a major issue. But if the coming generations say, we want access to information and we don't care, then it will just merely be an issue of privacy that's for a bygone era. I guess the most interesting thing about the internet is what it's done to communication. We always say that in terms of information transfer, it is the world's greatest advancement. But in terms of entertainment, it has certain flaws and certain challenges, and we'll talk about that. But what the internet has really done to communication is put us all in cocoons. And I think there's some grave problems that's caused by that. When you think about the internet of today, we tend to listen to people who are like us. We don't ever come in contact with ideas that are different from ours. It's, it's almost this continuous loop. And I could give you some examples of it that fascinate me. But in the past in this country, we had arbiters. We used to talk about Walter Cronkite. And for those of you students, Walter Cronkite, you have to look him up in a museum. But for the older people, you know that he was viewed as the most trusted man in America. But in Walter Cronkite's era, information was basically judged as to its trustworthiness and was filtered. He was our filter. There were other filters, our major newspapers, our major networks. Today, those are pretty much gone. So anything is out there in the internet era. We don't have any more filters. We don't have any more arbiters. And, and, and it's really led to a nation, and in many instances, the globe, where there's much less consensus today. Um, and, and we have different views of reality. Um, a lot of it's not fact-based, and I want to talk about facts. I'll give you one example, and, and by the way, since this is an example um, on the Obama side, I know that I can give you examples on the other side, but somebody sent me an email a couple weeks ago, and it talked about Michelle Obama and how she had 37 staff members and that she was spending money in a way that was a disgrace to America and that, and that, and that um, Laura Bush only had one staff member and Jackie Kennedy had one staff member. And Hillary Clinton only had three staff members. And it just went on and on about the Obama, uh, Michelle Obama had changed the nature of First Lady and, and her agenda, and, and it went on and on. And I read it, and I instantly sent to a friend, who maybe views the world a little bit different than me, but I sent a note and said, I'm willing to bet you any amount of money that this story is just fraudulent. And I just, I don't normally do this, but I just went to Google search and by the way, you know, for all of you old people, uh, we didn't grow up in a world where Google search resolved every single issue. Uh, in, in the old days when you were a sports fan and you knew something, your friends called you and said, we have a bar bet. Now everybody goes to Google. But I went to Google search and I typed in um, Michelle Obama's staff size and immediately popped up four articles. The rumor about Michelle, Michelle Obama's staff size, it is fraudulent and here's why. And, and I thought the funniest thing was her staff size is exactly the same size as Laura Bush's. And then it talked about, you know, Hillary Clinton had 29 people and Jackie Kennedy had in an earlier era had eight or nine and, and um, Nancy Reagan had 11 or 15, whatever. And it said, you know, and it talked about all of the things in the article, just point by point by point. But we live in a world where I don't know how many thousands of people read that, went home that night and said, can you believe Michelle Obama does this? And I promise you there's stories out there about, you know, Donald Trump that are not correct. Well, maybe all the stories about Donald Trump. <laughs> Strike that. Say, you know, Jeb Bush. But, but it's, it's funny. You know, I, I love uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan's comment. You're entitled to your own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And I would tell you in the internet era, you are entitled to your own facts. And when Stephen Colbert talks about truthiness, it's a different world out there. One of my favorite moments was in the Trump campaign where he had the infamous, you know, I saw terrorists 
you know, in the rooftops of New Jersey on 9-11. Some of you are nodding. And it was conclusively proven it didn't happen. And I saw focus groups of the supporters and they said, we don't care. The idea that we judge people by facts are of a bygone era. And it's, and it's fascinating to me. So in the internet, any idea that comports with your view of reality is allowed to have, you know, have credibility in your world. And we live in different worlds, and you see a, a bitterly divided country. And, and when we talk about red and blue states, uh, the view of the world and people in different spheres, it, it's really fascinating. Um, what's, what's fascinating is what the Internet has done to traditional media, and I want, I want to talk about all of them. I want, to, I want to, since, you know, I'm not getting paid a lot tonight, <laughs> um, I think I'll make you guys work a little bit. How many of you read a daily newspaper? All right, this is, how many students, let me see the students. Students, raise your hand. Okay, how many of you read a daily newspaper? All right, well, one or two, that's about right. Um, older people read newspapers. In 1955, something like 88% of 18 to 34 year olds read a daily newspaper. Today, it's less than 5%. The decline of readership in the newspaper business is shocking, certainly among younger people, but among all adults. Uh, we always say in newspapers, they have a consumption problem. They really have a, an economic problem. I'll give you one example. I do the Aspen Institute every year with, with one of the most interesting guys I've ever met, a guy named Craig. And Craig, if you met him on the street, you would probably say, here's a dollar. Very rumpled, um, very awkward social skills. Craig has taken, I would say conservatively, $100 billion in the last decade from the American newspaper business. Why? His name is Craig Newmark. He had Craigslist. Craigslist, which doesn't really make much money, and he does it sort of as a public service, has destroyed the classified ad business of the entire global news business. Newspapers used to have, as their bread and butter, classified ads. And today, they are a fraction of what they used to be, largely because of Craigslist. So what has that meant for the newspaper business? Combined declining circulation with almost the complete disintermediation of the classified business, it's led to shocking declines in economics. I'll just give you one example. In 2000, the Chicago Tribune Company bought the Los Angeles Times, Times Mirror. They bought it so they combined with their papers and they paid $8 billion for those newspapers. Twelve years later, the LA Times papers along with the Tribune papers, the Times were about half the size of the Tribune, combined were valued at $400 million. So just half of the newspapers of that company were worth $8 billion 12 years earlier. And by the way, it couldn't find any buyers for the $400 million. It gives you an idea of the shocking, shocking um, economic degradation that you saw in the newspaper business. And then the question becomes, if these are not businesses, what happens? Um, we have a saying that there's a lot of things in the internet era that aren't businesses, they're hobbies. Most people that I know try not to have hobbies. Uh, for, forgive me, let me correct that. They try not to have hobbies that provide their livelihood. Big difference. Um, but the question becomes, if newspapers fail, who are our watchdogs? I've had politicians on the right and the left say to me, you know, if the newspaper business is gone, there's nobody to monitor what we do. And we, I spent a lot of time in our institute this summer asking the question, if the economics are not viable for a business, how do we provide the service? One of the challenges is you have a public that says, I don't care. I don't care whether I get my information from somebody who won three Pulitzer Prizes or who is, a, is living in his parents' basement typing out information. But I would submit that if we don't have those Pulitzer Prize winning journalists and we don't provide 
the information, society is gravely, gravely harmed. One of the things we've talked about, I always kid my, my friend um, at the Lilly Endowment um, and tell them that the Lilly Endowment may be the economic engine behind newspapers. Because if, if the endowments, if our foundations don't do it, then the last place to fund newspapers is the government. How many of you, raise your hand if you're thrilled about your government providing the watchdog for your newspaper business? I don't see many hands going up. So that's, that's really the challenge. And, it, and, it's, and it's frightening because, you know, I've spent my whole life competing with the newspaper business. And I've always said, boy, if newspapers go, it's really wonderful for all of us broadcasters. But it's really frightening for the democracy. It is a grave, grave threat to democracy if we don't have the people providing information and giving us the critical checks and balances. Um, I want to switch to television. And I'm going to ask you some more questions. How many of you have cable? Almost all of you do. How many of you don't have cable? I guess I could have probably done that. Okay, decent amount. Um, how many of you buy Netflix? Uh, the younger people, everybody buys Netflix. Okay. Um, television has become wildly fragmented. I, I've said of these traditional media, newspapers have just suffered a shocking loss of consumption, which has led to a shocking loss of economics. The economics of the television business are better today than ever. But the challenge is that there are more choices. Um, now, there's some people in this room who grew up with three channels. These would largely be the first four or five rows. You're all laughing and nodding. <laughs> to the people in the back row, I will quote what a, friend, a young friend of mine said. If you only had three channels in the 50s, I understand why the communists gained so much ground. <laughs> um, but what's funny about it is, is we've seen this monumental fragmentation and I've always been a student of the economics of television. We were in TV and, and we got out of it. But it's really been a fascinating cross-subsidy. I thought I would share that with you just a little bit. But let me ask another question. How many of you watch more than 20 channels a week? Nobody. How many of you watch 10 to 20 channels? How many of you watch less than 10? All of you. OK, let me give you some news. The average cable bill in the United States is about $150 a month. Congratulations, you are all paying for about 180 channels that you've never heard of and never watch. That is what you're nodding your heads. And, um, and that is really why things like Netflix have come along and what's called over the top. Because a lot of people have said, explain this to me. And you didn't really ask me to explain it to you, but I'm up here, so I might as well. Um, what happened was the cable industry grew because when cable came about, it was, it was brought about to provide television reception over, over mountains. And what happened was it provided clear reception and people were willing to pay a little bit for it. But the cable industry didn't have to pay the broadcasters. So in Indianapolis Channel 6, 8, 13, 4, there wasn't a 59 then, got zero. But the cable industry kept getting money. And what they learned was a very interesting fact of nature that when people took their antennas down, they were a captive audience. They didn't want to put them back up. So the cable industry kept paying, charging you a little bit more and a little bit more, and they kept creating some product for which they charged you. So they had an interesting situation. Your bills went up, they charged you a little bit more, and they allocated that to progr programming they owned. For example, CNN's a good example. HBO was an example. TNT, things like that, USA. And the industry grew and grew and grew. And it started, you started putting in channels that people were paying for. And since you were a captive audience, they charged you a little bit more every month and every month. And we got to these $150 a month bills. The broadcasters said, wait a minute, everybody's getting paid but us. Then they started using their leverage and they started getting paid. And it's created a system where, like I said, most Americans watch less than 10 channels a month, but they pay, the average cable system has probably over 200 channels now. So it is a monumental cross subsidy. And a lot of people have said, we have to break that. That's why you have situations where there are, you know, what's called over the top programming. Let me ask you a question. How many sports fans do we have here? 
Lots of sports fans. Okay. How many people never watch sports? Okay, a lot of you never watch sports. Oh, my wife, thank you. <laughs> That's when I knew that she doesn't watch sports. Um, if you're a sports fan, you're happy to know that of your cable bill, you pay about 15 to 18 to 20 dollars for all your sports channels. In Indianapolis, it's Fox Sports, it's ESPN One, it's ESPN Two, it's ESPN Broad Ripple, it's ESPN Zionsville, all those things. Um, but if you don't like sports, you've been paying an average of $15 a month for things that you don't care about. This is called a cross subsidy. And for sports fans, I'll give you a little bit, and being in the sports business, we got into it for this reason. But one thing we learned in the sports business was that as long as this goes on, there's more and more money, or as a friend of mine said in Major League Baseball, the rates just keep going up, and all 105% of every dollar we get from television, we give to center fielders and point guards. That's pretty much the economics of sports and television. But now, they're talking about breaking the bundle. So what you pay for is a bundle of television. And the question is, what happens if the bundle breaks? The biggest problem will be in sports, because sports depends on the 80% of people who don't regularly watch sports subsidizing the 20% that do. Let me say it another way. All your sports fans, raise your hand again. Okay, how many of you would be glad to pay $35 a month for ESPN? Okay, that you have now identified the biggest challenge in sports. If the bundle breaks apart, the economics of sports are really a mess because it depends on 100% of the subscribers paying so that the sports franchises get their money. I don't know if I've made that clear, but we'll have time and question and answer. But that, that's really the big challenge. And, and of course, things like Netflix have come, and they've, they've talked about all sorts of studies where people say, I only want Netflix, I only want HBO, I only want the local channels. But, but to do that, they have to break apart the bundle. Now, let me tell you one more thing that's kind of interesting. Cable industry. Um, the cable industry sort of has an interesting situation. If you take your cable subscription out because you want to watch Netflix and you want to stream video, can anybody tell me who the prime beneficiary of that is? It's the cable system. Because you're paying, about 75 to 80% of the people are paying their cable company for their internet access. So as we always said, if you tell Comcast, those wonderful people at Comcast, gee, I don't want to pay you $150 anymore for programming, I just want everything through my broadband connection, I can promise you pretty soon, as your consumption goes up, your cost of broadband will go up dramatically. This is the challenge, and, and I want to get into the wireless industry because that creates another set of, of challenges. But I can tell you that one of the challenges of watching any programming through broadband, in one, in one sense, but even more specifically through the wireless networks, is that you consume a tremendous amount of data. And how many, of you, how many of you have meter data plans? You know what that is? A few of you, okay. Most of you have unlimited data in your smartphones? You don't know, okay. You will start getting your data plans metered. Let me give you one example. I'm a sports fan. I wanted to watch a, a Pacers game one night on my iPad. I was out. My wife was thrilled I took the iPad along, but it was an important game. And I watched the iPad, the game, on my iPad, and my entire data allowance for the entire month was burned up watching one basketball game. That becomes a monumental challenge for consumers, and I want to get into it as we get into radio. But as you can see, on the television side, there are going to be lots of challenges. What will you pay for? How will it be delivered? As we've said before, the Internet is the most efficient information transfer mechanism the world's ever known. But it is very inefficient or mass distributed entertainment. And when I take you through an example on the radio side, you'll get a little bit better idea. Radio doesn't have a consumption problem. The same 93% of the population listen to radio today as they did in 1970. It's fascinating that the perception of radio is the challenge. Most people 
in the United States, it's funny because we're now working all over the world. Most people in the United States say, oh my gosh, I don't know who listens to radio anymore. Well, do you listen? Well, I guess I do in my car. Yeah, I do in my clock radio. But the perception is Spotify and Pandora have taken over the world. How many of you listen to Spotify here? A lot of young people. Okay, I just, I'm not going to disparage you. I, Spotify, of course, was founded by ISIS in Syria. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. It wasn't. It, it really, it wasn't. I, it was, Spotify was clearly founded by Al-Qaeda. Um, no, <laughs> seriously. Seriously. How many of you listen to Pandora? A lot of young people. It, okay. The interesting challenge, and we have it, is the perception is it's cool, it's hip, and we're not. How many of you listen to daily radio? All right. All the students, you, you've passed the semester, you can go on to the summer now. You listen to daily. No. Seriously. Um, what we find is the perception of American radio is, oh my gosh, it's yesterday's news. Pandora is cool. Spotify is cool. Here's the challenge, and it's, it's, it's funny because we saw this with a study of media buyers, people who supposedly know. The question was, ask of media buyers, how many people listen to radio every week? Media buyers said 55%. The answer is 93%. They asked the question, is Pandora the same size as radio or is Spotify the same size as radio? And media buyers, these are people living, or a living buying radio and TV, said Pandora and Spotify and radio, American radio, are all the same size. Actual listening to American radio is nine, is nine times bigger than Pandora and 17 times bigger than Spotify. But that creates a monumental challenge of perception. Um, the most interesting part is that while these are the shiny new objects, the economics are awful. I'll give you one statistic, which I think is fascinating. The market valuation of Spotify today is nine and a half billion dollars. That is four times larger than the entire American radio industry. Spotify last year lost 200 million dollars. They have never made a profit. I have a good friend who founded Pandora. We were getting ready to give a speech, and I got interviewed about a week before, and I said, we, we made more money at Emma's before breakfast today than Pandora's made in 11 years. And he laughed, thought it was funny, and said, unfortunately, you're right. We've never made a profit at Pandora. Here's the reason why the economics are challenging. And the reason I bring this up is, obviously, this is what we wrestle with, and, and I'll explain our answer to it. But this is ultimately a challenge for the consumer. Because, as we say, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Although, there, is there ever a free lunch at Marion? Probably not. <laughs> as people start incurring data costs, they start having to pay for them. Now, there are early subsidies. I, I have a Tesla. I love my Tesla. And they have given me wireless connection. And they've never charged me for it. So I called them after a year and said, boy, this is great. I have you know, 3G connection in my car. And you don't charge me. And they said, that's not going to last long. <laughs> but let me give you an example of the difference, the dis difference between internet distribution, which we call streaming, and over-the-air broadcasting, which we call over-the-air broadcasting. I have a radio station in Los Angeles, Power 106. The cost of electricity to power our transmitter is $39,000 a year. So for $39,000 a year, I can send my signal to one person in Southern California, or all 17 million, no incremental cost. But if I took my transmitter down and streamed, like Spotify and like Pandora, my cost to reach my listeners over the course of a year would be $1 million. That's just my cost in data consumption. And my listeners, who will start understanding when they get data metered, will pay over a million dollars because I buy data in bulk and they don't. In addition, in the data networks through streaming, I have to pay higher music licensing fees in the United States that I don't pay over the year. So just the economic consequences of the exact same content to the exact same listeners is $39,000 versus about two, two and a half million dollars. Now you can understand why Spotify, Pandora have never made any money. And the only way you can solve it is massive subscriptions. Now what we find in audio is that it is, it is very, very difficult to get people to pay for audio. There's a breaking point in television. 
but people care passionately about their video. They do not care as passionately about their audio. How many, I'm just curious, of the Spotify people, how many of you pay for subscriptions? A couple, okay. Um, but generally we find that the take rate is very, very small. I've learned that there's a lot more disposable income at Marion than in most schools, which is important to learn. So the question becomes, if we can't, and I've been streaming audio for 20 years, because we have to provide it as a service to our listeners. But we've always said that if, if streaming is our only business, it's not a business, it's a hobby. And for those of us who have mouths to feed, we kind of try to find business solutions. So what we did is we discovered something that we thought was really kind of fun and fascinating, and that is that every smartphone in the world has an FM radio. The reason being, in the rest of the world, listening to radio through your smartphone is standard practice. In India, they tell us that over 90% of all radio listening is done through a smartphone. So I got drafted a number of years ago by our industry um, to find out about this issue and get the chips turned on. This was just at the dawn of the smartphone era. And it turns out that if you, whatever your smartphone is, you have a radio built in. So our challenge was to get that radio turned on. At the same time, we concluded that it wasn't enough to turn the radio on. We had to provide people, especially young people, with a cool interface. So we built what's called Next Radio. And because I didn't want to bore all of you, um, I didn't bring slides and show it to you, but I do have one. And if anybody wants to see what Next Radio looks like afterwards, basically it is just it just is a on your phone. It shows you every radio station in the market and what they're playing at any time. So if they're playing the Foo Fighters or they're playing the Rolling Stones, you see it. Whatever the song is, you see the album from that song, and you can rate the record. You can share it with your friends. You can tell the station you like it or don't. You can buy the song if the artist is coming in town. You can buy concert tickets to that event, and when the station has promotions, you can, you know, enter the contest or find out where the event is. We are now entering the era, now that we're close to six million downloads, we'll start doing advertising this year. And what that means is you hear an ad for McDonald's, and on your phone it pops up. If there's an ad for Egg McMuffins, when you hear Egg McMuffins on the air, a, pop, a, a coupon will pop up or whatever McDonald's wants, you can hit a button, immediately put the coupon into your phone, drive to McDonald's and redeem it. What it does is it makes radio interactive and it capitalizes by doing all the things that we've done over the air for almost 100 years, but puts it in the one device that people have. We've been very, very gratified. Um, we, have, we have found that this may be the answer to radio's problem. One, we've tested millennials and when they see next radio go, now that's really cool. Um, obviously, being cool is very important because Spotify is, how many of you think Spotify is cool? All right, well, these are the ISIS people again, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but what we found with Next Radio is when they see it, it's cool. And what we really find is when they find out that, A, listening to music through Next Radio doesn't cost you any data and drains your battery five times less, all of a sudden people think it's really cool. So that's, we're just rolling it out. We're having a lot of fun with it. Um, one of the reasons that we found that was important was in the previous eras, people bought Walkman. I, every, how many of you know what a Walkman is? Well, everybody does. Oh my gosh! I guess the people in the back see, have seen them in museums, or your great grandparent, right? You saw them. Um, in our industry sold 45 million Walkman 20 years ago. Today, the sale of portable radios is zero, and there's one reason: because the only portable device anybody carries is this, and people carry it 24/7. The average person looks at their smartphone 154 times a day. My 11-year-old, I think, there are some people only look at it once because she looks at it 500 times a day. So. <laughs> um, what's fascinating is that what we, what we found is that we can win the portability battle because we have a tremendous advantage. We're the only free thing. And as people start getting data costs, um, we find in all of our research that they say, wait a minute, you mean there is something free that doesn't drain my battery? So we're very excited about it. Um, and obviously, with interactive advertising, it's something we've never been able to do before. So we're very excited. We think it could be a game changer for radio. 
um, because it really provides us with a way to compete with the shiny new objects of the internet. And it really provides us with something that economically can make sense. But the biggest challenge in the internet when it comes to information, or when it comes to entertainment, is that it really depends on the willingness of people to pay for the distribution. So broadcasting is one to many, and it, it, the distribution is pretty much free. The internet is one to one, and one to one creates economic consequences. The point to consumers is, if you're willing to pay for the additional distribution, there's no problem. But if you're not, and what we find over and over again is so many people realize that the one-to-many concept makes a lot of sense. So I guess what I would say is, for better or for worse, the internet has changed our lives dramatically. It will change our lives even more dramatically as we get to the era of the Internet of Things. How many of you know what the Internet of Things is? Raise your hand if you do. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So the Internet of Things is basically the ability to connect devices to other devices. So, for example, you will have a wireless connection to your refrigerator, and, and your refrigerator can connect to your grocery store. And when you're out of eggs, it will immediately register. And we can connect billions of devices. Now, what's ironic about that is, again, is spectrum. Spectrum is very scarce in the wireless world. So again, all these things can be done, but they consume spectrum. And when I say consume spectrum, I mean consume data. So there's, there's a cost, but there's also a remarkable opportunity. The Internet of Things is in a world where they say in 10 years, everything will be connected to everything else. Um, they're even talking about, you know, taking pills that we might that might go through our digestive systems and immediately link to a medical center to read them out. So all of these things are possible. It's a world in which everything is possible. Most of the things that we can do through the new world of communication are incredibly beneficial. They'll increase our lives. They'll change all of the knowledge that we have. They'll provide information and benefits to all 7 billion people on the planet. But we also have to be aware that with that is a cost. And the cost is a loss of privacy. The cost is the ability to interconnect people who may do monumental harm to billions of people. It's a brave new world. It's a challenging world. But I would tell you, as someone who spent his life in media, uh, Every new day is exciting. And I thank you, and I hope we have time for plenty of questions. Thank you. So uh, the way this works, and a lot of you are familiar with this, in front of you, you have a, uh, I don't know if or not, but you have a uh, microphone here, a speaker. So uh, raise your hand, and we'll call on you, and then push the button that says, um, so push. <laughs> Hold it down to ask your question. That way everybody will be able to hear the question and it also will be recorded. And then um, Jeff will be happy to answer, answer the question. We have some time to the question. Just go ahead and raise your hand and get a question. Yes. Some years ago in the 50s in Austin, Texas, there was one television station and people who applied for licenses were turned down. Yes. That one television station was owned by the LBJ Industries. Yes. How much control today does the government have over what you've been talking about? Well, it's interesting you say that. Um, because you're talking to the person who ended up buying the LBJ radio stations. <laughs> uh, and I have to, and, and, and I, well. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> LBJ was Lyndon Baines Johnson. He was the President of the United States. I actually got to meet Lady Bird and Lucy, uh, and we ended up buying their radio stations. They sold, but I think they sold their, T I'm not sure they sold their TV stations too, but you're right. It's a fascinating part of history. I happened to read uh, one of the Johnson biographies, and um, it was a, I don't know, kind of an interesting story. I guess we can tell it. Lyndon Johnson, when he was a congressman, was visited by a guy who said, you know, I'm, 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 I can't get my license through the FCC, um, help me. And Johnson basically said, well, I don't know if I can help you. And then Johnson went to the FCC and got the license. 
and and <laughs> hard to believe in our political system, but. But Johnson got the license, and Austin, and we've been in business for many years. We own Texas Monthly down there, and uh, we've done events. And, and Austin was the largest American city with only one TV station for many years. For some reason, the FCC could never figure out how to grant uh, another license in Austin, even though it should have had, you know, two or three. Now, that was many, many years ago. Um, but I would tell you, I, I think the question was how much of that goes on now. If it has in the, in the 40 years I've been in the business, I haven't seen it. Um, the, the commission's pretty transparent, and I've dealt with uh, commissioners. As a matter of fact, on, on Next Radio, we've had every, every one of the commissioners supporting it. Um, and the reason they support it is because in an emergency, when the power grid goes out, the only way that you can be informed is radio. Because you think about it, when the power grid goes out, your cell phone's worthless. And your TV's worthless. We had a TV station in New Orleans during Katrina. And we were very proud of the fact that we had an emergency generator when we got back up on the air 36 hours later. The only problem was nobody had power. So the only thing people could listen to was portable radios. So that's why we had support. But, but I would say, generally speaking, government's been pretty transparent in our industry. Did that answer your question? Okay. Well, actually, I was looking broader. Yeah. Well, I think I think that's I think the real question is is privacy. You know, on the one hand, we want to catch terrorists, but we've we've also said we give up. You know, and and what fascinates me is studies of young people who say, you know, I, I don't care. You know, I, I don't care about privacy. I'm, I may ask that maybe my next question to ask you guys. Yes. You mentioned the power grid, and. Where are we going to get all the electricity to support the Internet of Things and all this? Well, it's not, it's not really the electricity as much as wireless spectrum. Because if I'm a washing machine, um, well, if I'm a washing machine and I'm, communic and I'm communicating with, uh, a, you know, a sensor at another, on a, you know, on a washing machine factory, we are going through the wireless system. One of the things that's happened is the phone companies have said we have to have more, more spectrums. How many of you have followed the spectrum auction? Is anybody, do you know what I'm talking about? Few of you do. What's happened is the FCC has gone to TV and said, you, you need to sell your unused space so we can give the wireless companies more spectrum for things like the Internet of Things or watching Netflix or listening to Pandora. Um, they're running out of spectrum. I'll give you one, one statistic. In the first four years of the, of the iPhone, AT&T's data usage went up 21,000%. That is higher than my daughter's allowance has gone up. <laughs> so the reality is, I don't know. There is, there, is, there, you know. there is certainly a question. What I can promise you is, as usage goes up and systems get strained, consumers' costs go up. What's fascinating is people said, well, yeah, in wireless, we understand data metering, but what we're finding is in your broadband wired connection to your home, you're getting metering. Now, most of you don't, won't see that yet, but it, probably in five years, and I can promise you one thing. If you cut your cable bill, you, and you, you cut it, and all you have is broadband, and you watch all sorts of things through Netflix or Hulu or all those things, I promise you one thing. Your broadband bill will skyrocket. Yes. You'd shared that uh, newspaper has a consumption issue going on and the economics of that. Have you seen the same situation with magazines and that whole no, publishing? Yeah, industry? magazines have. It hasn't been quite the same. Um, what we found with magazine readership, it's actually held pretty well. The perception of magazines has suffered. So our advertising is down a bit, but our circulation um, in our specialty magazines held up pretty well. Uh, what we find is for, we have things like Texas Monthly, Indianapolis Monthly, uh, Los Angeles Magazine. Actual readership's held up better than general interest magazines. Time, Newsweek, Sports Illustrated, people have all struggled a little bit more. One of the big interesting challenges there is, and, and we thought when, when magazines went to tablets, you could do a lot more. So, for example, if you like Sports Illustrated and you get your magazine on a tablet and it talks about a game-winning home run, you hit a button and you see the home run. And we thought, boy, people are going to love this. So far, not so much. 
That's interesting. Yes. I wanted to ask you to go back to what you were talking about earlier about privacy issues. Um, I taught a government class this fall that was about half and half. About half the kids had no real worries at all. The other half were scared to death that everything they do for the rest yeah. of their lives is going to be yeah. public information right. or at least um, managed by the government and or big corporations. Right. Are there any kinds of potential protections down the pike? There's all sorts of discussions. I'm going to ask our students, how many of you are gravely concerned about privacy? Some are. How many of you just don't care? Okay. It, it's, it's really fascinating. Um, it's split. And, you know, I, I have to tell you, I, I'm a fossil. Um, but I'm amazed that college kids will post the most amazing things <laughs> on their Facebook pages. And when you, I mean, you know, and we, and I, you know, I think we're a pretty progressive company, but I can tell you, my HR department, when we interview people, will check their Facebook pages. And if you're getting ready to hire somebody and you see them pretty much dancing, you know, naked in Monument Circle with banned substances, it's probably going to hurt their employment prospects. <laughs> and yet we see it. And it's like privacy, I don't care. You know, and we always laugh. A friend of mine said, you know, the things we did in college were probably every bit as indictable <laughs> as the things kids do in college today. But we didn't leave a record which would last for a thousand years. <laughs> you know, if we didn't get arrested on the spot, it was over. Now, it's like, you didn't get arrested, I know, I'll share it with my 7,000 friends. So it's a different world. It, the privacy issue is one that fascinates me. I will tell you, I just saw the beacon technology with Next Radio. We now know that we can tell you where people are listed to radio on the smartphone, where they're driving, where they're going. And it's fascinating. Yeah. Got to be some more back there, aren't there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Mike? You didn't mention, you didn't mention satellite radio. Yeah. Uh, It was not founded by the people who brought ISIS or Al Qaeda, but we think that it was early Bolsheviks. No, no, I'm kidding. I'm talking about Sirius XM, I, I kid about that. Um, Sirius XM is an interesting niche. Um, it is now doing very, very well. It has about 8% of the population, about 25 million subscribers. I happen to be a, a satellite radio user. I like it. I can get news. I can get niche channels. What we find, again, is that most people won't. Uh, one of the big questions about SiriusXM is what percentage of their subscribers are on deals from, you know, you buy a car, you get it for a year. Uh, one thing that they did that I, I, I love as, a, as somebody who's owed money to banks, um, they pretty much flushed $9 billion of debt down the drain. Uh, they were going bankrupt about four years ago. Uh, a guy named John Malone came in, basically made a deal with the banks at like five cents on the dollar. And it's amazing. Let me give you some business advice. If you have $9 billion of debt and it goes away, your business looks a lot better. <laughs> um, and now, now that they don't have all that debt, they're doing pretty well. But it's a niche. People say, does it kill radio? You know, it's another part of fragmentation, but they sell no advertising. Uh, I think the total advertising sold is almost all on Howard Stern, and it's probably maybe, you know, $200 million a year for all of satellite radio, uh, as opposed to our the radio, American radio industry, $17 billion. Yes? Um, you were talking about the uh, price of the cable yeah. going up and up and up. Uh, I've talked to a few people that I know that had the traditional cable system and so forth, and they're raising it. And they, it got to the point, they, both of them told me this story, and I maybe get your feel for this. Yeah. They said, we did away with the cable, and we went straight to Netflix, which right. comes right through the computer, So because right. the kids are all watching the yeah. movies and stuff. We didn't yeah. watch that much TV. Yeah. And we did, to get our channels, somehow they paid like 80 bucks, went down and bought a little box, yeah. rigged it up side of the, I don't know how, somewhere in the house, and they get all of the local channels and stuff. Yeah. How does that work? Well, it's a strange thing. And, and this is, and, and, and you're, it's just an antenna. 
It's just, it, it, how many of you younger people know what I'm talking about? An antenna, okay. It's just an antenna. So what, if you, so all you need to do to get local stations is stick an antenna on your roof or on your TV set. What I, what I marvel about is most people said, what in the hell is that? <laughs> so if you want, if you want to get Netflix or, or stream, you know, audio, you have to have a broadband connection. But if you want to get channels two, four, or not two, we don't have two here, four, six, eight, 13, 59, 20, you know, and, and by the way, they now have digital channels. So there's like three sub-channels. So if you just want local television, there's probably about 30 choices out there. And it's, it costs you zero. And when we're in the industry, I, I always loved, the cable guys always said, because I was you negotiate with them, and they'd say, television is free. So how in the world can the broadcasters ask us to pay them? And we used to say, television is free. And if people want to stick an antenna up and watch it, it's free. But if we give you... Mr. Comcast, our signal, and you charge people $5 a month for our signal, we want to get paid. But the reality is, over-the-air broadcasting is totally free. And it's fascinating to me, and, and by the way, about 15% of the population does exactly what your friends did. They stick an antenna, the antennas are good enough, you can stick it on your TV set. Of course, your TV's flat now, so it doesn't quite work the same way. But, but you, you know, an antenna just gets the signals out of the air. Very simple, and all free. Yes, Pierre. So uh, in addition to your career in the private sector, um, as, I, as I noted, you also were um, President Clinton's ambassador to the uh, International Telecommunications uh, Union, right. the United Nations. Would you mind like sharing a particular uh, memorable experience or insight from, from that part of your life? I had a few of them. Um, I'll tell one funny one and I'll tell one serious one. Um, one morning, um, this was in 1994, and one morning I got up and I'm, I'm watching the TV and the Iraqis were going back to the Kuwait border. Now this is after um, the original incursion in the early 90s, and the ambassador from Kuwait came up to me and said, oh, Mr. Ambassador, I, am, I need to know, is your country going to support, support us? Will you protect us? And I, very matter-of-factly, said, "You have yes, our country will be there. Now, I think this woman thought that I had been up all night with President Clinton talking to him about what he's going to do with Kuwait, instead of realizing that I had just turned on CNN and seen the same thing anybody could see on CNN. I'll never forget one of our State Department people kiddingly said to me, you know, thank goodness that you watched CNN this morning instead of the Cartoon Network, or you couldn't help that woman. <laughs> So that was, that was kind of, there were some fun experiences. We had a delegation of about 50 people. Uh, the most fascinating thing was that it turned out, and you have to think of the world in 1994, uh, after Oslo and when there was a, a hope of peace, but we got an early uh, missive from the Arab states that said that they desperately need communications infrastructure in, in the Palestinian territory, and that if, if the United States would support that, um, and fund telecom infrastructure the, that they would allow the recognition of Israel. And in those days, there had never been recognition of Israel in, you know, in any of the U, in, 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 by the Arab states in any UN, UN body. And it was the most fascinating thing in the world because I sort of ended up going back and forth uh, and talking to both sides and talking to subsets of both sides. Um, and I learned more about the issues. I, I absolutely was fascinated. It's pretty well known. I'm Jewish, uh, which I'm sure the Israelis knew, and I'm sure the Arabs knew. Um, I found that it, it was something I read about Henry Kissinger. It said Henry Kissinger was Jewish, and it made him more even-handed. And I think that was true. I found myself listening more intently to the Palestinians and the Arab countries. And it was probably one of the most remarkable things I've ever done. What was fascinating is we reached an agreement uh, I, it was probably certainly the most unusual thing I've ever done. Uh, and when I look at the state of the Middle East today and see where it is and think how much, how close we were in 1994 um, and how far away we are to peace in 2016, it's a little depressing, but it was, a, it was quite an amazing experience. I, you know, I, um, 
I, I was a part-time diplomat. I was kind of, the, the administration was kind enough to ask me to do this. I could keep my day job and after we were done at night, it was, it was the previous morning back home so I could call the office and catch up on things and, um, and, um, and I loved it. Uh, I can tell you that if you haven't experienced the State Department of this particular country, it's, it's an experience, but I, but I love the people. Some of the, some of the rules and regulations of the State Department baffled me, but it was fun. Yes? Talking about being a dinosaur, uh, stations, broadcast stations were licensed to serve the public interest, convenience, yes. and necessity. Yes. Or which to sell advertising and, and make a profit in order yeah. to, be able to do that. Yeah. Where is that today? Where is it? Where is it? Are you what kind of are you still held as broadcasters to do that? You are. It's it's kind of it's interesting and I've had this debate with friends who've been on the FCC uh, and, and I'm one of these people, and I think there are a lot of people in broadcasting who really believe, I got to speak to a Bosma Enterprises group today, and I, I believe that the, the DNA of most broadcasters I know it really is imbued with the idea that you, you're there to make a difference in your community. Uh, and I take great pride in the fact that we have a, a, a record blood drive in, in St. Louis, and uh, we have a thing called, you know, Hip Hop Cares in New York, and we do, we do events and, and really raise millions and millions of dollars, and, and, our, and our employees volunteer. Uh, so I'm proud of that, and I'm proud that, and I think it's, you know, I, I just think it's a core value of our company, but I think it's true of most broadcasters. So, yes, you are involved in your community. Yes, I think most broadcasters do that. On the other hand, the idea that, you know, you, you got the, the spectrum for free, is not exactly right. Uh, as a friend of mine said, the guy who got the Spectrum in 1920 got it for free. The guy who bought it in 1921 from the first guy paid for it. Uh, and so, as another friend said, if I'm, on, if I'm on free airwaves, would somebody please call my bank and tell them that? Um, so it's kind of a misnomer. I think, you know, we still have licenses. Um, I would tell you, it, it, very rarely are they ever revoked. Um, in Indianapolis, for those of you who might remember the, the Don Burden cases many years ago, one of the few. But, you know, in, in our 35 years, have we had a few fines with the FCC? Yes, uh, not many. Um, but I think most people who are broadcasters know that whether their spectrum is free or not, they're licensed to serve the public interest. And I think most, most people take it seriously. Not all, but I think most do. Yes. Emmis is headquartered in Indianapolis and always has been. I'm sure they've had opportunities to move throughout the years. Why have you kept Emmis in Indy for, for as long as it stands, I guess? Forgive me, I didn't hear that one. Emmis has always been headquartered in Indianapolis. Yes. Yes. It's home. My family's been here for over 100 years. Um, there is a possibility in any given day in February that I might change that thinking. Um, but seriously, it's been home. I, I have great pride. When I went to school, I went to school in Los Angeles. And undergraduate, stayed for law school. My dad talked me into coming back home. My first six months back home, I said, I, what have I done? Why am I here? And after that, I have, I have, I believe, I love the spirit of this community. Uh, I've been involved in a lot of things in this town, and I'm very proud of it. We don't have a lot of natural advantages in Indianapolis. But what we have are people who, when they give you their word, they'll do it. Uh, when, when they get involved in, in something for the, great, the greater good, they'll do it. And I love that about Indianapolis. I'm very proud of it. So there are times in, uh, in, in the winter uh, when I, I think about other places, uh, when I'm skidding along. But, uh, but it's home, and, it's in it, and I'm very proud of it. It's a good place. Yes. Uh, a concern like with the WIBC, just could you give us a little insight into uh, the situation where Limbaugh wasn't carried after July, and right. and, and just kind of what, because he was with you guys for like, since day Many one. Years. And I can tell you, and, and it's funny, my dear wife, uh, wherever she might be, which is over there, um, we always have the same discussion. I love this show. Why is it off the air? And answer one through 101,000 is always the same. Not enough ratings. 
Um, Rush Limbaugh's audience was declining and it was getting older. And, and it, so sometimes you have enough audience, but it's tough to sell. Uh, and in addition, because of his controversy, and, and you know, my politics are known, I'm what we call the moderate Democrat. Uh, as you know, WIBC is pretty conservative Republican. So we've always believed that you absolutely, if you do your job, you absolutely positively have to serve all audiences. Um, so people think, you know, oh, I ordered Rush Limbaugh off. No. Um, if, if, that, if it were my decision, he would have been on 20 years ago. Um, but the reality is there's a place for him, and I've known Rush and kind of kidded with him. Uh, but it was, it, it, it's, by the way, it's something that's happening in a lot of places. Um, he lost his affiliations with big stations in a lot of places. There'll always be a place with smaller stations, but it's an aging audience, and uh, that's, that's really it. And by the way, that's, that's a challenge with talk radio. Uh, talk radio is, is very conservative, and it's aging. And the problem is that um, it needs to be younger. That's why we've tried some things to make, you know, we understand the audience for talk radio is conservative, but it needs to be made younger. We got one back there. So I use uh, iHeartRadio sometimes, and I'm yeah. just kind of wondering what the difference is between iHeartRadio and Next Radio. iHeartRadio is, number one, it's the largest radio company in the United States. iHeartRadio itself is a streaming service. So, for example, it is you are using data, uh, but you can, and by the way, with, with Next Radio, you can only listen to local radio. Think of Next Radio as just a transistor radio in your, in your phone, whereas through iHeart, you can listen all over the world. Um, but, it is, but it is a streaming service. And so the idea is Next Radio is, and I could tell you, you know, a, lot, a lot of things, but that's basically the issue. One of the things that's funny for sports fans is, what we're learning with, with Next Radio, we're talking to the major leagues and, and with ESPN, is that I, I take Next Radio to the Colts games. And even if the local broadcaster has the right to carry the games, because it's, it, it's streamed, there's a delay, there's buffering, and in, and in sports stadiums, really, there's difficulty with, with wireless connection. So the only way to get a sporting event live is through local radio. Um, but it, the difference is streaming versus over the air. So they, they have 800, iHeart, the company has 850 radio stations, including Q95 here and uh, WOLT and a few others. But the iHeart system is a streaming system, just like Pandora, just like Spotify. And by the way, my company's been streaming forever. We're on the iHeart platform. So our radio stations are on there. We're also on TuneIn. How many of you know what TuneIn is? Not many. They're not doing a very good job. <laughs> any, um, any, we got any more? Yes. Okay, one last question, and then um, we will have a reception afterwards in the lobby. We'll have, like, some uh, light refreshments, and uh, uh, Jeff is going to stay for a, a little bit. Sure. And talk to him, take some pictures, whatever. So we we'll carry on the conversation outside. But this will be the last question. All right. <clears throat> Thanks. You've had a very unconventional path, and I'm kind of predicting that for my son, who's about to start college in the fall. Um, I'm really wondering how you feel your academic background has helped you or maybe hasn't necessarily helped in your life and career. I, I was a history and telecom major, and I was going to get a master's degree in telecom, and somebody said get a law degree and specialize in broadcast law. And um, I, uh, I am, I'm very pleased. If I had it to do over again, I might have gotten an MBA along with it. I am a fanatic about education. I think the more education you can get, the better. Um, and I, I, I can't say enough about what my college education and my law school education did in my career. Did it help me learn how to, you know, write commercials? No. But it, it taught me how the world operates. And I think, and I think it, for those of you in school, I urge you keep stay in school. And if you're thinking about a graduate degree, I would say, you know, fabulous. Thank you all. Thank you.